The Holy Gospel according to Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who'd been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She'd endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he'd entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we heard that after a long day of teaching and preaching, when evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let's go across to the other side. The other side of the lake, that is. That's eight miles. Just a little Sunday evening three-mile boat trip. Only, as you remember, it was no cakewalk, was it? When the wind and waves almost overcame them, these seasoned fishermen feared for their lives. Then in the beginning of the fifth chapter of Mark, which we didn't hear this morning, but is in between these two pieces, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. This is where the man in the tombs lived. He was an outcast, possessed, they say, by a thousand demons. Jesus handily sends the demons packing 
going right into the herd of swine who promptly run down a hill into the sea and drown. Now we pick up in today's reading. Jesus gets back in the boat with his disciples and crosses back to the other side. That is, back where they started. And this time, a great crowd gathered round him. One of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came running up when he saw Jesus. He fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter's at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may live. Please, Jesus, my little daughter's dying. Come, quickly. Jesus, I beg you, my little daughter's dying. Please, come, save her. A man of faith and leader of the synagogue, when life and death were on the line, he turned to Jesus. Because of his position in the synagogue, he put everything on the line for his little daughter. There was no going back. My father was like Jairus. When I was two and unable to breathe on my own because of polio, my dad pleaded with Jesus to save the life of his little daughter. My throat was cut open, creating an opportunity for others to help me breathe. How very fragile life is. How it is supported by, well, thin air. We're reminded in Ezekiel, then he said to them, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I was in an iron lung for months, and when electricity failed, my dad would come to the hospital at all hours of the night and crank the machine. My dad was a construction worker, and having a family member with polio meant he could lose his job. Everyone was afraid of polio then. My mom couldn't go to the grocery store. It was the church family, the body of Christ, that ministered to them while I was in quarantine. Funny thing, my dad rarely talked about it. He was humble, a man of quiet faith, and I am the beneficiary of his begging. Pre-pandemic, when I'd go to a mall or actually anywhere in public, complete strangers often come up to me and want to lay hands on me, saying something like, if you had faith, you'd be healed. I think, wow, little do they know that I do have faith, and I have been healed, that my very life is witness to a miracle. If they only understood that the marks that I bear are reminders of this miracle. This miracle is called life. When on the third day Jesus rose from the dead, he also bore marks of his suffering and death. So who are we to expect that there will be no reminders of our healing? That just like Jesus, we will also bear the marks of our suffering and healing. We do not know what marks or reminders of her death and resurrection remained with Jairus' daughter. We do know that she got up and walked. But could she speak? Did she recognize her family? How had she been changed by this miracle? We know that she was forever left with one mark that she could never escape. Those whispers she heard as she passed others on the street. There she is. She's the one. She's the one that was dead and now is alive because Jesus called to her, woke her up, brought her back. That's her. 
When we pray for healing, what are we praying for? What do we expect? Longer life, less pain, a return to the wholeness God intends for us? Sometimes when we pray, we cannot see the whole picture. We only see our little sliver of the picture. What would God want for us? What would God want for the body of Christ? Today, right now, as we gather here in the sanctuary, within about five miles of here, if we could listen, if we could hear, we might hear the cries of desperate parents making the same urgent plea that Jairus made, that my dad made. Jesus, please save my child. My little child is at the point of death. Please save my child. Sometimes we forget that God was a parent too. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could it be that God could not bear to witness the death of this child? So when there was nothing left for one brief moment, an instant, really, God turned away. We know that in spite of all the praying, every other day, a child dies at Rady's Children's Hospital. We do not know why some children return to their families and others return to their father. Some, like Jairus' daughter, have loved ones praying for them because they cannot pray for themselves. Some, like the woman with the hemorrhages, reached out and grabbed hold of her healing. Some, like the Gerasian man in the tombs, in the story immediately before today's reading, cannot pray for themselves and have no one to pray for them. For them, Jesus comes unbeckoned from great distance Maybe because there is no one left to plead for them, Jesus comes, bringing unimaginable healing and wholeness. Not to follow Jesus on the journey, but, return, but to return to life in their community. That's what healing's for. Thankfully, mercifully, we know one who knows us and loves us. One who, even from death, brings healing and restores us to life in this world and in the world to come to life everlasting. Let us pray. Here we are before you, Lord. We are always before you. You hold in mind each one of us as if there were no one else in the world. But we are often unaware of your presence, here, together, coming to meet with you. We become conscious of you as the reality, the true basis of life. Amen.